Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be transmitting stories of contemporary Japanese ceramics. I'm really excited to welcome Alice and Halsey North and Louis Court to talk to us about their newest book, Listening to Clay, Conversations with Contemporary Japanese Ceramic Artists. And just to give a, a quick introduction, Alice and Housley North are pioneering collectors and patrons of contemporary Japanese ceramics. Since 1994, they have worked with curators from the National Museum of Asian Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston to research, document, and contextualize their collection. The primary focus of their collecting and advocacy has been to introduce new audiences to this art form. They have donated ceramics from their collection to numerous museums, notably the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which also houses the database archives and library for their collection. And Louise Court, who I imagine many of you are familiar with as well, is a curator emerita of ceramics, National Museum of Asian Art, Smithsonian Institution. Her research interests are historical and contemporary ceramics in Japan, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Her publications include Shigaraki Potter's Valley, Valley, I promise I can speak, Isamu Noguchi in Modern Japanese Ceramics, A Close Embrace of the Earth, and Chikusa in the Art of Tea. In 2012, she received the Secretary's Distinguished Scholar Award at the Smithsonian Institute and the Kuyama Fujio Memorial Prize for Research on his Historical and Contemporary Japanese Ceramics. Still a little early in the morning, my tongue's not quite going yet, but today we have a, a really exciting kind of schedule. We're going to start with a, a brief presentation or perhaps a, a slightly longer presentation as they have very generously agreed to introduce the content of their new book, which is very exciting. And from there, we'll dive into a conversation where I'll pose some questions. I encourage all of the listeners to type into the chat any questions that you have as we go along. And at the end, we'll have a, a Q&A session where I, I pick those up and we can further the discussion. So... Alice and Louise, can I hand it over to you for the introductory Lynn. presentation? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Zach. Thank you also, Lynn and Lisa and all the SWEAT members listening in. It's a wonderful opportunity for us. We're delighted to be able to introduce our book to you. And Alice and I will be speaking. And Halsey North will also be joining us probably for the Q&A session, but he's listening now. So the three of us all send our greetings. The idea for this book began in 1994 when Alice and Halsey joined me in visits to ceramic artists living in Tokyo, Kyoto, and Hagi. So the visits to these artists were arranged by Koyanagi Atsuko, director of the gallery Koyanagi in Tokyo who had a special flair for discovering the work of young ceramic artists whose work departed from conventions of form and scale. That trip resulted in many enjoyable long-term connections with the artists we met then. And in fact, during that initial trip, we visited many of the artists who ended up appearing in this book. I was then curator of ceramics at the Freer and Sackler Gallery, Smithsonian Institution, and I was very interested in expanding the museum's collection of contemporary Japanese ceramics. But I knew that in order to do that, I had to meet the artists themselves. Halsey and I had been collecting contemporary Japanese ceramics for eight years. And we were also organizing and producing ceramic tours to Japan for New York's Japan Society. We organized those tours around meals with the artists in their homes and studios to have time to listen and talk. The three of us, Louise Halsey and I, had been friends for many years. A friendship sparked when Louise and I discovered that our strong interest in Japan started when we both lived with families there as high school exchange students, oh. thanks to AFS Internet Cultural Program. Sounds like there's an AFSer out there. <laughs> <laughs> Louise pursued a graduate degree in Japanese art history at Oxford, and spent a year studying Japanese at the Inner University Center in Tokyo. Later, she lived in Kyoto three and a half years while completing her book, Chigaraki Potter's Valley. I majored in Japanese history and language in college and spent my junior year studying at Waseda University in Tokyo, again, living with a Japanese family. The three of us share a passion for ceramics. 
Ellis and Halsey fell in love with North Carolina pottery as newlyweds in the 1970s, when Halsey was head of the North Carolina Arts Council. In the 1990s, they decided to make room for collecting contemporary Japanese ceramics. So they donated most of their American pottery to the Mint Museum in Charlotte. With that extra space in 2004, Halsey and I returned to Japan to start collecting seriously. The Japanese arts curators at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston had invited us to give a lecture and help create an exhibition of our collection. All of a sudden, we realized that our collecting had meaning beyond our own enjoyment. We visited 39 artists, studios, artists and studios and families. During that 2004 trip, we asked each artist what work he or she would like to have exhibited in the United States. Their responses helped guide us in making purchases and our collection grew to over 325 documented works. These are the works from our collection featured in the exhibition Contemporary Clay, Japanese Ceramics for the New Century at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in 2005-06 and at New York's Japan Society in 2006-07. Mishima Kimio was one of 26 of the artists, their family members and curators who came from Japan to see the Contemporary Clay exhibition. She is wearing one of the special name tags I made for the artist, so everyone would instantly know them by their works in the exhibition. Later, we held a party in Kyoto to celebrate the Contemporary Clay exhibitions with the Kyoto artists and their family members. We started working on our book in earnest in 2007, when we three found ourselves in Japan once again, Together, Alice and Halsey joined a tour I organized for the Friends of the Freer and Sackler, and we carved out time to pay return visits to artists whose friendships and evolving work were especially meaningful to the three of us. We began to realize that these interviews might become the basis for a book. The artists' compelling stories of how they became who they were would appeal, we thought, to a broad audience well beyond people with a specific interest in Japan. Moreover, the artists would have an opportunity to speak for themselves in their own voices. One artist even told us, this is the first time I've had a chance to tell my story in my own words. And these are the artists in the book. The oldest artist came of age in the World War II years the youngest grew up amid Japan's prosperity in the 1960s through 1980s. We have also included stories of five of the most influential ceramics dealers whose support has helped shape the artist's careers. Now we'd like to introduce you briefly to the 16 artists in the book. Let's start with Kondo Takahiro, who belongs to the noted Kondo family of Kyoto potters. He is the grandson of a living national treasure who specialized in cobalt blue decoration on porcelain. Kondo Takahiro certainly believes in listening to clay. He said to us, when I studied at Edinburgh College of Art, I noticed my approach was different from that of the European students. I approach my work by asking, what does the clay want to be? It is a Japanese approach to think about the potential of the material, to listen to what the material has to say, and to try to imagine or feel what the material wants. Thus, the title of our book. Hondo has invented the surface treatment called Silver Myth. His patented combination of silver, gold, platinum, and glass which gives the appearance of shimmering water droplets. And here we are having lunch in the Kondo family kitchen after our interview in 2019. Akiyama Yo also spoke to us about helping the clay become what it wanted to be. He studied at the Kyoto City University of Arts under the great ceramic artist and teacher Yagi Kazuo. Akiyama Yo, in turn, inspired new generations of artists during three decades of teaching at the same university. The approach I use, Yo said to us, came to me as I was peeling the skin of a mandarin orange. 
I wondered whether it would be possible to peel the skin off a ball of clay and turn it inside out. I started using a blowtorch to harden just the surface of the soft clay ball. When I tried to peel the ball, though, cracks formed in the clay. I could see the cracks open across the clay's surface. It was thrilling and beautiful. The clay itself was speaking to me. We discuss Yagi Kazuo in our book because so many of the artists talked about him. He was a founder and leader of the avant-garde ceramics exhibition group, Sodesha. The Metropolitan Museum of Art's work here is part of his groundbreaking 1954-55 series that also included his most famous work, Mr. Zamsa's Walk. As a teacher at Kyoto City University of Arts, Yagi Kazuo galvanized a generation of students to transcend traditional forms and explore sculptural ceramics. Yagi Akira is the son of Yagi Kazuo. Akira is skilled in making exacting wheel thrown and carved porcelain glazed with his own pale blue or lacquer-like black glazes. He pursues the challenge of creating geometric progressions of shapes in graduated sizes. He is as interested in the spaces around the individual objects and their mutual interaction as he is in the objects themselves. Akira told us, my most significant inspiration came from the way my father taught me to look at the shapes of things. My father and I would go walking and he would tell me to find shapes that interested me, trees and rocks and so forth, and to look carefully at the colors and forms. He would ask me what I thought of this or that, and he would encourage me to think carefully about the shapes I saw. From that training, I gradually built up a reserve of interesting shapes in my mind. Itamura Junko was another student of Yagi Kazuo at Kyoto City University of Arts, where she met her husband, Akiyama Yo. She covers her forms with intersecting galaxies of intricate, impressed, and pigment-filled geometric motifs. I fill the entire surface with pattern, she told us, but I want to avoid making a clearly resolved design. I want to leave uncertainty. The oldest artist we interviewed, Hayashi Yasuo, was born into a Kyoto family that still fired its ceramics in wood-fired cooperative kilns, which were banished from Kyoto around 1970. During World War II, he trained as a kamikaze pilot, and his later ceramic sculptures, like No Sound Sea, reflect the impact of nighttime flying. The landscape below me became part of my work, he said. I explored how to express within cubistic forms my strange experiences of perspective while flying at night. No Sound Sea had a special meaning for Hayashi Yasuo. He explained that he was commemorating his father's death and spirit journey through the passages of time and space to his ailing wife's bedside, where he bid her farewell as he departed this life. I wish he to Halsey because he was touched by Halsey's account of a similar experience when Halsey's father said, just before he died, I have to hurry, your mother is waiting for me. Ayashi Yasuo said to Halsey, you understand. Mori no Hiroaki Taimei is the eldest son of a ceramics making family in Kyoto. In the 1960s, he spent three and a half years teaching at the University of Chicago. I use stonework clay, he said, and I shape most of my work with coil building. When I'm working by hand, I am free to make whatever shape I want. Glaze is an essential aspect of the beauty of my ceramics. I develop the recipes for all my glazes and formulate them myself. Miyashita Zenji was a classmate of Morino's and a lifelong friend. He created his surface designs using thin overlapping bands of clay, which he custom colored with cobalt, chrome, and other metal-based pigments. 
He applied the bands to stoneware bodies, producing images evocative of mountain scenery, seascapes, sunrises, and rainbows. Miyashita explained, I started mixing mineral pigments into the clay itself to create the colors that I liked. With ceramics, you have to learn to break the rules. If you don't, you can achieve work that is distinctive. Fukami Sueharu is one of Japan's most recognized ceramic artists, known for the purity of his graceful porcelain forms. He invented a way to use a compressor to inject liquid clay into molds to produce his sculptures. He is careful to leave no trace of his touch. He said to us, I decided to devote my life to sculptural porcelain with pale blue glaze. Where the glaze is thicker, it approaches blue celadon. Where it is thinner, it is closer to white porcelain. This variability is my gateway into a world of different hues in a single piece. Fukami became a ceramic artist during the economic prosperity of the early 1970s. He recalled, the economy was supporting the Fukami family workshop. So as a younger son, I was free to make whatever I liked. I also saw all the exhibitions I could see, read all the books I could read, attended all the lectures I could attend and studied intensely on my own. Those experiences had a great effect on who I am today. Ah, now we have Miwa Ryukisho, eldest son of the celebrated Miwa ceramics family in Hagi. He became the 12th generation head of the family in 2003. Ryukisho trained in sculpture at Tokyo University of the Arts. He became a meticulous but always unconventional potter, using his clay to express his most intimate, troubling, or joyful feelings. Miwa Ryukisho told us about his graduation piece at Tokyo University of the Arts. It was a series called High Heels. I grew up in Hagi, he said, which was not a place of elegance like Tokyo. Young women wore clogs or sandals. One day, however, I came home from school to find that a guest had taken off a pair of white high heels before stepping up into the house. It was the memory of those exotic shoes that inspired high heels. I expected my shoe sculptures would be lined up on the table with the tea bowls and cups made by other students. My professor objected saying, a shoe can't be on the same level as vessels that touch people's lips. A shoe must be on the floor. I replied, it's not a shoe like I'm wearing. I won, my shoes were displayed on the table. Also born into the celebrated Miwa family, known for its tea wear, Miwa Kazuhiko is the third son of living national treasure Kyusetsu XI. Kazuhiko became Kyusetsu XIII in 2019. Kazuhiko's six years studying at the San Francisco Art Institute freed his imagination and helped him rethink how clay could be used for artistic expression. He named this tea bowl after El Capitan, the vertical rock formation in Yosemite National Park that he visited many times. Upon returning to Japan in 1981, Kazuhiko made large sculptural clay installations before turning to tea bowls. For this installation, he called Dead End, he took 40 tons of clay into a gallery in the Yamaguchi Prefectural Art Museum built a road with a guardrail and rode back and forth on it with a Jeep and then with a motorcycle. Hanata Masanao is an eighth generation Hagi potter who is university trained in sculpture. He is known for his technique of scooping and carving solid masses of clay rather than throwing on a wheel. He is wholly committed to using indigenous Hagi clay and glazes I admit that hockey clay is very difficult to work with, he said, and yet it is very precious to me. I make my work by drawing out the characteristics of the clay. My ceramic style represents what hockey clay allows itself to do. 
Toriyama Yasuhisa is a master of the distinctive effects of wood-fired local clay and natural ash clays associated with the ancient ceramic center of Shigaraki. His trademark technique of slicing the clay with a thin guitar string opens the surface to the stony interior and sharpens the edges, highlighting the natural roughness of the Shigaraki clay. As he told us, the wire works really well on the clay. It's like cutting tofu. Takure Zaki Ryuichi is known for using the coarse kind of clay that many other ceramic artists in Bizen would discard. Clay speaks a language peculiar to clay, he said, not a language as we know it, a language with which it communicates and makes you want to touch it. That's because clay is part of the earth. The clay spoke to me and told me how to use it. Mishima Kimio's witty trompe l'oeil work criticizes our throwaway culture. In the 1970s, he invented ways of silk screening and transfer printing onto clay to create realistic representations of trash. Cans, bottles, newspapers, comic books, and cardboard boxes. At age 83, her 2015 retrospective filling the vast Art Factory Jonanjima exhibition space in Tokyo, heralded her commercial breakthrough. Since then, galleries have honored her with multiple solo and group exhibitions. Koike Shoko was the first woman to complete the graduate program in ceramics at Tokyo University of the Arts. Sea forms inspire her abstract sculptures, as does her upbringing as the daughter of a professor of Western clothing design. Shoko constructs the shell-like forms with darts and pleats by pulling, folding, pinching, and raking the clay. Shoko reflected, my creativity comes from within myself. The evolution of my work comes naturally as I touch clay and shape things with my hands. When I am working, I feel as if I'm singing a song, but I also take the work seriously. I produce very few works since finishing a single piece can take up to three months. Ogawa Machiko studied ceramics in Tokyo and then in Paris, and then spent three and a half years in West Africa, acquiring local potter's skills of hand building, molding, and paddling. These experiences confirmed her enduring fascination with rocks and minerals, and she pursues this fascination by uniting clay and glass in her work. Ogawa Machiko told us, the first time I touched clay was after I entered Tokyo University of the Arts. I thought I would become a painter or a printmaker. But when I tried ceramics, I realized that the idea of working outdoors and the smell of the smoke from the wood fire really suited me. The conversations in this book became possible because we developed comfortable friendships with these artists over many years. On occasions when Japanese ceramic artists came to New York City, Halsey and I hosted informal dinners in our Upper West Side apartment and served home-cooked food on dishes made by ceramic artists. Our goals for the dinner parties were to honor the artists, make them feel welcome, and enable them to meet collectors, museum curators, journalists, gallerists, and other clay artists from across the United States. We hosted these dinners for over 20 years, averaging four a year. The artists reciprocated this hospitality, trust, and respect when we visited them in Japan. The three of us returned to this project with gusto in 2017, translating and transcribing our taped interviews by means of the internet. In 2019, we traveled to Japan to meet with all 16 of the artists and four of the dealers in order to update the stories of their lives and work. Upon returning, we resumed our collaboration in order to weave together the multiple conversations with each artist into their final forms. Our publisher is Monicelli Press, an arm of Faden in London. Its distributors are Penguin Random House, our book is available on Amazon or Faden or many other book sites. 
Thank you everyone for listening. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so thank you so much for, for giving us this very generous look into the book. Alice, can I have you hold it up once more to show everyone? It's, it's a very, it's a considerable text. And if you, if you turn it sideways, you can see. And, and there's really, I mean, the pieces themselves are, are of course extremely exciting. And then when you look into the book, it's so much more than just profiles of these individual artists. It, and there's really a lot of depth there. And I hope to, to go into that some and pull that out a little bit as we talk about this project and kind of what went into it. And I guess, you know, so this, this book really evolved out of a collection of, of works that, that you had gathered and the artists who, who made them. Could, could I ask for a starting point, you know, what, what, was, what was behind your, your choice of the, the ceramics and the artists? Did you, did you start with a certain criteria for, for how you picked them? Or was there something in particular about Japanese ceramics that you were kind of trying to, to find or express through, through your collection? If you could maybe tell us a little bit about that as a starting point. Alzi? Oh, basically... It was accidental. The, the book evolved by accident because we knew the artists, we fell in love with their stories, and we wanted to start collecting the stories. And, and then who got picked and the who got included in the book evolved based on who was available when to be interviewed. And Part of that was the serendipity nature of Alice and I being in Japan at the same time with Louise. And we always kind of floated towards those artists we knew the best, which goes back to the artists that we met with Toya Nagiatsu. So it's the old familiar tale of you go to what you know. And we basically interviewed people we knew and trusted and loved. And that's mm. how we selected the artists. If I can add, I think though it's important for everyone to know that Halsey and Alice collected directly from artists for a very long time. And so they were meeting people, interacting with them, seeing their work in their workshops. And at that point, adding pieces to their collection. So that firsthand encounter from the very beginning, I think was a major factor in how your collection developed from my perspective. Absolutely. And it also broke down the barrier yeah. that most journalists would have with artists because we became more than interviewers. We were, we were, collectors and part of their collecting family. And that makes a big difference. And we were there to interpret. And most all of them had been to our home in New York. And right. we had hosted dinner parties for them in New York. And those dinner parties were strategic. They weren't just a bunch of people around having fun. They were with gallerists and journalists and other collectors and people who could advance the artist's career. And if we knew new collectors who might be interested in someone's work, we'd invite them so they could meet the artist before the show opened and get to know the artist. And that always seemed to help produce more sales. You know, they'd be working at three or four or five different galleries, but we always tried to get, get folks in to meet the artists. So it was about strengthening relationships, which strengthened careers. Okay, so these introductions, many of them came through Koyanagi at school. You're saying, was there a, was there a trend in kind of the artists that, that you would be led to as well at the time? This, this project, of course, has spanned a really long time. So I wonder, you know, the, the appraisal of the, the artists at the time when you were first meeting them, were, were most of them already very well established? Were they still up and coming? Was, how was that? They were very much up and coming. Yeah. 
we, we got in on the front end and we were Garth Clark Gallery in New York City hosted Junko, Kitamura Junko three times. And one, the third time her husband, Yo, turned to Halsey and me and said, I want a show in America. <laughs> Junko's had three, can you help me? And we were able to get him a show through a wonderful curator who was putting together a show on Kyoto at Smith College. And Yo, so Yo had his first show there and the rest is history. Oh. But Alice, the, the advice you gave to Akiyama Yo was key. <laughs> you can't leave that up. Well, at the, when we knew Yo, he was making room-sized work. Uh, in fact, we saw an amazing room-sized work at the Shigaraki, the new a ceramic park there. And many other places, room size. So when Yo turned to us and said, please, I want to be seen in America. We said, Yo, your works are too big. They won't fit in a New York apartment. So we wrote to him and said, please make a small work for us. So he started a new line of tabletop works that were the right size and could be delivered from Japan to America, to Smith College, and wherever they went, they all stayed in America. They were all sold. It was really great. Okay, so the, the interactions also <laughs> kind of affected the, the way the different artists were, were making their works, perhaps, or for some of them. That's something that'll be nice to hear about a little later, maybe towards the end of the discussion. I'd be really interested to, to hear about that as well. So for the interviewing process, because you had, you, had, you had met all of these artists and you mentioned that you were able to form very comfortable relationships with them. They went on for years. You hosted dinners. You also ate with them. Could you tell us a little more about the, the interview process? Was it, you know, what kind of difficulties were involved? Were the, were the questions prepared ahead of time fairly deliberately or how much of it was just conversations kind of flowing into to different directions? What was that like? Well, the, we definitely had questions prepared ahead of time. There was a standard set of questions and we soon learned that that was not very helpful. And we basically started out with some standard questions and then consciously deviated following the flow of the conversation. And Louise would do the conversation and then she'd do a rough translation. And so I would know what was going on because I don't speak Japanese. And that gave her a chance to kind of think through it her own mind summarizing what she'd learned. And then I would come up with another question to be asked. And so I kind of directed the flow of the conversation to some extent, and Louise got to refine it. So I would head us off to the Northeast, and then she would refine it by two or three degrees in one direction. <laughs> And it really turned out to work pretty well because it gave her a chance to think through the refinements of her question while I was playing with the broader topic areas. Yeah. And then at the other end, my job was to take the broader issues from, you know, 10 years of interviews mm -hmm. and sort them into their component piles. So if we're dealing with, oh, Kakuruzaki Ryuichi, and he's dealing with the issue of how do I make pots out of interior clay, I would create a pile of all of the interviews we had with him, and I would sort out that particular topic. So my job was to sort the interviews into topic files and then line them up in some kind of logical sequence and make sure that the integration of those made some sense. And then I passed them on to Alice and Louise and they would work to retranslate the work all over again based on the combining of the topic and create 
sense out of a jumble of various discussions covering one specific topic. But the various interviews would approach that topic from different directions. So you've got different perspectives on the same topic from the artist, uh, which made it very interesting. Am I making sense? Oh, yes. No, that it's, yes. And so you, you really got to, you got to talk to the same artists with, you know, time lag several times. So you were able to, to kind of go back and revisit topics from, from different angles, which it, it makes sense. That's why probably the, there's so much depth to the, the interviews. When you were talking with the, the artists, did you, did you start out with, so for me, when I got a chance to look at the book, what really struck me was this sense of a cohesive kind of historical story, larger story. It really felt like a history, even though it's formatted as these profiles. And that really was exciting to me. When you were doing these interviews, did you ask artists questions that would kind of tie them together actively, or it's all questions focused on each person and they kind of ended up connecting? Yeah, it, that's it's so nice to hear, Zach, that you see it as being a kind of history told through individual voices, but we never, we didn't want the artists to generalize. And so we didn't ask them questions like, what do you think of post-war Japanese ceramic art or that kind of thing? We kept them fairly tightly focused on their own work. And then of course they had comments to make about how they saw the bigger picture. But the sense of history comes maybe because we finally ended up choosing, I remember we said, you know, how are we going to put these all together? What's our logic here? And we decided we would start with the oldest and finish with the youngest. Mm -hmm. So we did know that people would be reading, if they chose to read through the book from front to back, they would be reading in a kind of chronological order, starting with the experience of someone who came back from the war, survived his kamikaze training and resume making ceramics to the very youngest artist, Kondo Takahiro. And of course, there are a couple of decades of younger still artists now who are missing from this book. And it would be wonderful if someone else would take up this kind of topic and, and move it ahead through time. The baton has been passed to our listeners. <laughs> yes, please, <laughs> listeners, go for it. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, you're singing to Louise's heart because it really did at one point become very clear. It was more than a book about the artist. It really is an overview of post-war Japan. It can be really viewed as a social history of post-war Japan. And it's very interesting because it covers it from one very, very specific angle, but it does show the flow and scope and ebb and flow of the economy and social values and, and what people were interested in and how their spending money changed, how they yeah. changed their spending patterns. So to kind of take, a, take another step back, now that we know a little bit where it ended up, at what point did you kind of start to feel that the content would make a good book in this format? Was that something that was really quite early on or was it partway through the process? How did, how was that as you went through these interviews and meeting these artists? Cause I mean, I can imagine how you could think about so many other formats for introducing their stories, even if it is just as, you know, through individual exhibitions, but to want to kind of group them together to, go back to them and kind of deepen the interviews and make it in this format. Was there a particular moment that all of you kind of uh, remember that there was an aha or how was that? To be honest, I don't remember, but we started, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alice, but you had the idea of taping the interviews and we just wanted to make a record for these particular artists I don't think we had any sense of 
how those records might fit together for quite some time. But, but I think the artists telling their stories in their own voices became a guiding principle very early on in the process where the artist's voice was controlled by the artist. And that became very important. Yeah, yeah. It also had, once we started translating, Louise was doing the translating, I was doing the, the typing. And we used GoToMeeting, so we were using online. And we'd spend an hour a day during the pandemic we were doing a good hour a day of, or more translating and transcribing. And I got to sit there with my rusty Japanese and realized that Louise was doing an extraordinary job of translating. She was interpreting, she was realizing the context of what the artists were saying. She was putting that down, not word for word, but it just, I was listening to this book take shape. I said to myself, we've got to make a book. This is just incredible. We've got to have it in some format. Maybe it'll be online, that everybody can read it online was one of the first things we were thinking. But I was a very lucky person to hear that happen. Thank you, well, Louise. I, I, the point we made, much of the book's success is Louise's brilliance and her ability to contextualize the interviews as she was conducting them because of her yeah. knowledge. And so she was able to contextualize during the interviews, but during the transcription process, she was really able to refine it even further. So that's why the interviews come across so smoothly and richly is because she was able to do all of that kind of simultaneously. And it was brilliant to see her take three paragraphs on the topic and, and chew it up and, and have it come out. Oh, thank you guys, but enough. <laughs> <laughs> A difficult but, skill. But it is important yeah. to mention, and Alice talked about our gathering for an hour a day by go to meeting. Alice and Halsey were in Manhattan I was in Washington. In fact, I'm not sure you and I have seen one another since <laughs> our 2019 trip. Our 2019 trip, you're right. Yep. Um, yes. But we found that it was so fruitful to use the resources of something like GoToMeeting and be able to listen to the taped interview. Then Alice up there in New York was writing down what we heard, it was quite remarkable that it was able to work that way and really a satisfying way to work. I don't know what it would have been like if we'd all been sitting in the <laughs> same room. I think we, we would have given up. Well, it Alice, wouldn't have gotten done. Alice is not giving a clear picture. She spent an hour a day on the phone with Louise for an hour and a half, but it took her six to eight hours to get ready for that hour in terms of making sure the material was ready to go. It was as clean as possible. I had to make sure my pieces of information were pieced together right. Right. and she pieced it together even more. So, you know, that hour, it was the preparation to make that hour as productive as possible that made the whole process work. And that's all on Alice's shoulders. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Alice. You did a and lot of work. Thank the changes. You. Wonderful. So you mentioned that, of course, the standard set of questions that you originally went in with perhaps wasn't necessarily that useful and you really had to adjust as you went. I think a lot of people who interact with kind of Japanese artisans or artists have had the experience of having trouble getting people to kind of talk about their experiences or their intents, because many of them really will take this attitude of expressing themselves through their art. And of course, in this book, you have the very interesting theme of listening, which perhaps 
takes the center stage over speaking in many ways. Was it difficult to talk about kind of their thoughts and their own histories? Were they eager to do it? Did you have trouble steering the conversation? Was it really only because you had kind of these repeated opportunities that you were able to dig down or, you know, from the start, were you able to get a good go? What, what was that like? Well, I think the success of the interviews, even the initial ones, had a lot to do with how well the artists already knew Alice and Halsey in particular. They knew, as Alice said, that they had already committed themselves by buying their work, which I think to an artist means a great deal in terms of trust and respect. And so I don't remember too much trouble getting anyone to speak. There were a couple of people who were more familiar perhaps with being interviewed and knew that if you were interviewed, there was a danger of being misquoted, mm-hmm. what was written about you. And so one gallery owner in particular started off wanting to put all of his responses to our questions <sighs> in writing. Right. It took us quite a while. <clears throat> Or we convinced him that that's not what we wanted to do. But on the other hand, we were not going to put words into his mouth or distort what he was saying to the best of our ability. But and it was quite him. remarkable what he said once we had a chance to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Yes, once he started talking as opposed to writing. I remember that. when the artist wanted to see all the questions in advance and came to our first meeting with all of the answers written out that's and, right and then we just basically took that and ran with it and just started asking questions to fill in the gaps and as he loosened up we finally got a good interview two interviews later where he was relaxed enough to really talk about growing up in poverty and having to study learning how to draw by candlelight with crayons and that sort of thing. It's, they told us things that they just don't talk about in public. You don't talk about what you lack or the trials and tribulations of poverty and want, especially after the war. And they were willing to do that. And I think it's that process of just take what they give you and be flexible enough to to keep moving the ball forward without being pedantic or pushy. You know, well, what do you mean by you learned how to unmold the clay? Yeah. I'm not sure, could you clarify that for me? I think Alice and Halsey in particular were very careful when we were amalgamating the individual, or the various interviews into one final form and then polishing it there were certain things that artists said that I found very interesting for various reasons, Hmm. revealing Hmm. of certain situations. And Alice in particular would keep a firm grip and say, no, no, we can't put this in the book. This is something said to us in confidence. This would be a problem if somebody were to read this. Not that it's not true, but that it It's the kind of thing you wouldn't want in print in a big book. Mm -hmm. So there was that sense, too, that I I certainly learned to trust Halsey and Ellis's sense of boundaries. And I'm sure that the artists felt that, too, that they weren't going to be embarrassed by what they found themselves saying in print. We were all on the same team. Yeah, we were. We did a lot of writing to the artists and checking with them and saying, is this true? Did we get the, did we hear this correctly? So they were very much aware when we were working on their chapters because we would just pepper them with questions. Okay. And so you really came back and talked with them about that. I was just thinking, this is something that 
you know, Lynn and I had a, a conversation about recently this idea of really querying, you know, whether it's the interviewee or the writer or something to, to check, you know, what do you really mean by this? And, and how kind of going out of your way to do that and make sure that can build trust and can really also improve whatever work it is that you're working on. Kind of throughout that process, I mean, I, I know that there was already a good deal of trust there. And I'm sure with all those exchanges, all of the artists and the dealers as well felt very confident that you were trying very hard to stay true to their words. At kind of the end of the process, did you take certain steps as well to kind of show each of the artists or the dealers what had become of the interviews for them? What sort of content had finally made it into the book? Or how was that sort of exchange once you had finally kind of shaped everything up? Because that's... Also, perhaps an interesting point, that I think people who are making content that is of this nature, you've interviewed someone, you've looked at someone's life yeah. or something that's very personal to them, and then you present it in another language, kind of how do you kind of keep that, that level of, of trust and let people know what's become of their story? One or two artists asked to see the final form, one in particular, who's quite fluent in English. Right. So that made sense. Hmm. But wasn't that about it? Yeah, there really was very little desire to see the final interviews because they couldn't read them. They, they could see it in the book, yeah. They were very interested in what works we showed of theirs. That's right. Mm. You did a lot of corresponding, Alice, about finding the right works, the works that they saw. And many of the pieces in the book that illustrate the book are the pieces from Alice and Halsey's collection. But then beyond that, in many instances, it was going back and forth with the artists to ask what other works they felt were most representative of what they were trying to do or most important to be shown. That's very interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm really enjoying this. I think there's still a lot of interesting things there, even this, uh, yeah, the interest in what works are being shown. And I imagine originally this is kind of a bit off the track, but when you went to these artists and you were considering which pieces to buy, which pieces that you wanted to have or to potentially to introduce to the U.S., depending on the stage of when you were doing it, did the artists seem to ever have strong opinions about you know they really want a certain work to be shown to overseas audiences or what was kind of the, the artist's role in guiding your selection versus your own could you tell us a little bit about that Zachary when we went in 2004 to actually buy the things for the MFA Boston exhibition we did not tell them that there was going to be an exhibition at the MFA Boston because we were scared whether the curator would actually choose the work that we were buying but we did ask them what they wanted us to buy. And it was mind blowing to hear their reasoning of what they wanted us to buy. And we did that with every one of the artists and it, it paid off. I did see a question that somebody had that I loved. They said, where is the North collection? <laughs> and you can see some behind me, there's some in the living room, but mostly, we have given it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Museum in Charlotte, what? The Sackler Gallery. The Sackler Gallery, the Smithsonian in Washington, two Louis. The largest number on view right now are at the Metropolitan Museum on the Great Hall Gallery. They're on the balcony at the Met. And there's quite a number there on a show that's just opened that will be open for three years. The other thing to mention, since you gave the largest single group of your collection to the Met, it's important to know that you also gave all of your archival material and almost all of your books. All of the books. All yeah. of the books. I see a few books behind you. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we're hoping that the Met can acquire more collections of contemporary Japanese ceramic collectors and artists and become a center for that study. It's pretty exciting what they're doing. They have a wonderful curator, Monica Binsek, who focuses on decorative arts, who really gets it. Okay. 
So this is a great time perhaps to move on to some of my wider context questions because okay. I am interested in this. The, I mean, the book was a very long time in the making. And I wonder maybe if you could tell us a little bit, how have attitudes towards or interest in Japanese ceramics changed after the past couple of decades in North America? And perhaps even what was the influence of your collection on that change, if you see it as having had one? Absolutely. May I read from a book that's just been published by Joan Mervis, who's one of the dealers that we feature. And her whole book is on letting the Japanese know how contemporary Japanese ceramics are treasured in the United States. And um, almost every major museum has some. And this is from her book. Since 2000, there have been over 40 different exhibitions of contemporary Japanese ceramics at American museums, many of which have traveled to multiple venues, bringing the total to over 70 exhibitions across the country. Not one of these museums specializes in ceramic. Only one of these exhibitions originated in Japan, Soaring Voices, while the others were organized with material from rich, permanent American museum collections and loans from private collectors and galleries. Even important encyclopedic museums have devoted prized locations and space to contemporary Japanese play attracting audiences of all ages. So that's in part an answer to your question, Zachary. Soaring Voices in its current configuration or the final configuration started at a card table in our bedroom. When you <laughs> I had the flu or something. <laughs> right, we helped get that organized and actually did some early funding to help get that show on the road. I would say though, before roughly 2000, hmm. there were a few collections being formed. There's a very interesting collection in the Duxbury Art Gallery, south of Boston, formed by Carl Weyerhaeuser, who sort of plunged blindly into collecting Japanese ceramics and made a wonderful, very unexpected collection. But by and large, the ceramics that were circulating in the United States before then were the ones that had come to the United States in many cases through purchases made by Americans who were living in Japan during the occupation, mm -hmm. who would go to Mashiko over the weekend and see whether they could buy cheap seconds at, Yam at Hamada Shoji's kiln. Um, for people who were aware of living national treasures, although it was much less common for people, Americans who might have known of such artists, to actually buy those works. So the, the variety of, Amer of Japanese ceramics that could be seen was very limited until really Alison Halsey's exhibition at the MFA and Japan Society. And then I had a chance to do an exhibition at the Sackler Gallery in 2003, so around the same time, called Isamu Noguchi and Modern Japanese Ceramics. And that again, one of my goals with that exhibition was to bring to the United States the work of artists who Americans had not seen, notably, Yagi Kazuo and his colleagues in Sodesha. Mm. I wanted to make that work known. So starting there then, and dealers such as Jones started bringing pieces to the United States that other Americans could buy. And this whet the appetites of other people to form their own collections, in many cases, by going to Japan, buying in Japan as well as the United States. So slowly from around 2003, 2006, things started to, right? And I think it's wonderful now that, that if people are interested, they know much more broadly what the scope of post-war Japanese ceramics 
entails. It's not just folk art, not just living national treasures, but way beyond that. And of course, many of the artists in our book talked about how they felt. They didn't talk about folk art much at all. The Minge was not something I think anyone of them brought up, if I recall. Mm. But they did have more to say about the system that creates living national treasures and whether they wanted to participate in that or felt that it was uninteresting and they chose another path. Very interesting. Would you say that kind of this increase in showings and in the U.S. and the nature of collections and kind of the taste of the people collecting, would you say that that's had an active influence on the artists in Japan and the kinds of works they make, perhaps as opposed to what the collecting atmosphere is within Japan itself? I don't know if there's any interesting stories or insights you have on that perspective or if it's a weird question. But. When was it that we bought the Kuriki Tatsuzuke and Suzuki Osamu? There was a situation where Joan Mervis showed us two works that we fell in love with and had to have, and we didn't know the artists and we'd never know them. And that was the moment when from then on, we bought through dealers. We did not buy, we bought only our, rarely from the artists our, themselves. It was our 15th wedding anniversary. Um, and we've just what? celebrated our 50th. Uh, so it was a while ago. I think one of the things the Japanese artists have learned is that Americans don't really like cute kawaii. Just, am I saying that right? Kawaii. And so the kind of sculptural work that really comes across well in the US is more of the architectural variety or organic variety. And so the cute little telephones and rabbits and things don't come across too well. So that really gets eliminated. And so I think that's made a difference. To our generation, yeah. I do wonder, mm. you catch a 25 year old, show them some cute rabbits. I think <laughs> there's, there might be an audience. <laughs> Oh, now, yes. No. Uh, but it's a younger generation. And yeah, it's a, exactly. Yeah. In relation to uh, this idea of tastes and introductions, do you find that the works that you have brought over and introduced to North American audiences tend to acquire new readings or meanings when they're introduced here? Do audiences seem to interact with them in different ways than the pieces may be received or interacted with in Japan? And do you have any interesting stories or comments on that? Mm. We love watching people interact with the pieces in the museums. And we've often stood there and watched them and listened to them talk about our work. Haven't had that opportunity in Japan, so I don't know. Louise and Halsey, how would you answer that? I was just going to say, for most North American collectors, any kind of object that is made for tea ceremony use drops a significant meaning mm -hmm. associated with its form <laughs> and size and so forth. Although certainly there are plenty of people in North America studying tea who can make excellent use of their tea utensils. With the sculptural pieces that have no particular association with a specialized use that somebody needs to know something about in order to follow it, um, it interpretation is not very much of an issue, I think. These works are so accessible and Children especially love them. They're just, it's amazing. And that's why we love them. <laughs> and we love the people. Combination of the two. I think that sounds like a good place to end. We've come up on our 20 minute mark. So we'll have a question and answer session where our listeners can ask more insightful questions than I've been able to come up with. And so I'll start reading up those. 
Okay, the first question we have is from Mark Hovain. Hello. Hi, thank you so much. Hi. I'm really enjoying your presentation. It's fantastic. I'm asking you from Kyoto. I'm living here now for about 30 years. And I'm studying Japanese gardens but and Ikebana. But what's really interesting for me over the last three decades is of all the five senses, I remember first being really fascinated by the fact that when you talk about incense, you talk about listening to the incense rather than smelling the incense. So it seems to be like an ongoing theme that of all the five senses, listening is really foregrounded in Japanese communication and in the arts. And I noticed that your book, of course, is also called Listening to the Clay. So I'd be fascinated to know what the panelists think about this foregrounding of listening as one of the most important senses and how as Westerners, we might have developed or you might have developed your listening skills during your long association with the Japanese arts and with Japanese artisans. And as a, just like an extra piece, what we as Westerners might have to learn from the Japanese around listening. Sorry, that's a very comprehensive question, but it's fascinating. And I think that you're in a unique position to give an answer to that. So thank you for anything that you might have to share. Thank you, Mark. So how, how is it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should start by saying that the title was not our invention. It came from one of the artists talking to us about his listening to the clay. And I think it was Halsey who said, that's our title. <laughs> but I think listening implies a control of the self, sort of stepping backwards, not asserting oneself so much. And I remember that that's a skill to cultivate in Japan, importantly, for communication. But Alice Halsey? Listening to clay also reflects the fact that to listen with clay, it also is very important to touch because ceramics are meant for the most part to be handled and tea bowls and tea wear especially. It's the handling of them, as well as the looking at them, is so very, very important. And for many of these works, handling them. Now, the pure sculptural work, not so much. But a work that has some utilitarian quality to it, handling it, and in a sense, fondling it, making love to it, is important to really create that relationship. Uh, so if you're someone who is handling the clay. You all probably already know not to wear rings. The worst thing you can do is to go for a bowl and have something on your hand that's gonna scratch the, the bowls. But on the opposite side, Mark, that was just so insightful because what we're talking about is not our relationship with the clay, but the artist's relationship with raw clay and what they're going to do with it. It's a very insightful question. I don't know if we've given you the answer you're looking for. Uh, Thank you very much. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have another question, and this is a, a very practical one, and it's from Alice Gordinker. I'm sorry, my pronunciation is terrible there. I, haven't, I have failed, but Alice, are you there? I'm here. Thank you very much to our present presenters for this time that you're giving us today. It's really very nice. I saw your book at Robert Yellen's a few weeks ago and was really excited about it and the title and everything. And I think you've done a great job in connecting artists in Japan with people overseas. And all of us here in Japan really feel that it's very difficult for to get information out of Japan, to get, give artists a voice overseas. And for those of us who haven't been able to travel to the US to keep up with what's going on with museums and galleries, how, what, what can we do? Where are people active now post, you know, it used to be your dinner parties. It sounds like the North, <laughs> was that, that, was the, that was the place to be. 
But how about now? Are there magazines that are actively looking? I'm doing a little work for Ceramic Review in the UK, doing some Excellent. artist interviews that'll be published next year. But that's the first time I've managed to connect with an overseas magazine that seemed to be interested in the kind of material that so many of us in this group could be providing. So mm. what's what's mm. current and what do we do? How do we carry on the work that you've started here? Well, there are other journals. There's Studio Potter, which has been going for over 40 years now and is <laughs> now, unfortunately, no longer in print, just online, but that makes it very accessible. And Studio Potter actively invites submissions of essays of all sorts. Many of them are written by potters themselves. Ceramics Monthly also does a lot of reviews of exhibitions and tends to be a little more technical, you know, how I make my teapot spouts, that kind of thing. Not, that's probably not fair to them anymore. In terms of exhibitions and things, the best source is the group we just talked to, CASA. Japanese Art Society, Society of America. Society of America. One's really Lovely. worth joining because they're doing more and more online. So you can be a very active member now. They're starting to realize they should always do it online. <laughs> but they're also a great source of information about exhibitions. But another source of information for people interested in Japanese arts li living in Japan would be joining the Japan Art History Forum, JAH, mm -hmm. which again is a professional organization for art historians around the world. And again, conveys a lot of information about what's going on, where forthcoming conferences, topics, etc. JAHF has a website, JASA also has a website. They're easy to find. There's also now at Alfred University, a very active new museum of ceramics. And they have ongoing exhibitions. They just finished an exhibition about tea bowls and hmm they will become, I think, more and more a kind of center of activity. And then, as Alice was mentioning, or Halsey was mentioning, there's so many museums now that have exhibitions, either permanent or special exhibitions of either their own collections or loan exhibitions. If I could recommend that you go to the website of Joan B. Mervis Limited oh, yes. and, and yes. just devour it because she has now done 27 online presentations on Japanese ceramics. <sighs> and you can actually go and look at them. They're on her website. There are books on her website. There, there's her exhibitions. There's her special something on each artist. It's quite remarkable. Thank you, well, that was excellent list of sources. Thank you so much. So we have a question from Liam Lefferts. Yes, I'm here and I'm eagerly listening to everything. I just have a question as, a, as an anthropologist and curator. What is going to happen to all the wonderful material you've collected? And some of it may be privacy material. And so what are you thinking about that? The audio tapes, the notebooks that you talked about, Alice? the all the materials that you've collected i mean in addition to the pots which have gone someplace what about the material all the all the written material that you've got and the and the tapes themselves where are they going after all of this everything is at the met with the exception of the tapes and i have not had a moment to even think about archiving the tapes but that is coming up. We're to the point where I can do something else. <laughs> we had that conversation this morning. They'll probably go to the Met. Oh, they will go to the Met. Yeah, that's where our notebooks are and that's where they should be. It's, it's, I guess the question is, in what format? It'll be a computer file that has 
the actual interview. That would be so exciting it's to my, be able It's to... my hope. Okay, so that's something to look forward to. Alison? Or... Yes, I was wondering about the, the book itself. It's such a beautiful design. And I wondered how you came to find a publisher. I know that it's a, a fairly cutthroat industry and <laughs> often, you know, book proposals aren't accepted so easily. So what was the process of yeah, finding a publisher and editor like? We'd love to hear um, more about that. It was serendipitous and it was luck. We frantically scrapping around to find a publisher and focusing on academic publishing. And then a, a friend of ours had just come out with a book called, what was it? Objects it, USA. Objects USA. And we said, oh, you know, he's got this book published. Maybe he uh, can recommend a publisher. So he, we wrote him when he said, well, could you recommend a publisher? And he said, well, let me recommend you to my publisher. And he wrote her a letter sent her a highlight or review of the book and uh, an outline of the book that we had given him. And she agreed on the spot to be her publisher. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> well, the, the person was Glenn Adamson, who was, who was very well respected in both the, the Japanese and the US and the European ceramics world. He's a fabulous author and curator. So she listened to him and the rest, it took off very fast. We were almost not ready for the, to leap in as fast as we did, but she was great. Okay. So it seems it's quite a niche area for publishing and uh, you know, it's such a beautiful quality <laughs> design and book. I imagine that it's quite an undertaking, a commitment for a publisher. So did you say it was Montin? Mont, sorry, Monticello, Montanet. I forget the name of the publisher. Mon, Monticelli, M O N A C E L L I. Oh. An arm of, am I misspelling, Louise? No, you're right. Um, an, an arm of Faden, P H A I D O N. Uh -huh. oh. and, and Faden is, both of them are well known as art publishing. How is it? Okay, thank you so much. It's the book design is the first book of a new company. It was literally, they hadn't put the company together yet when they started designing the book. Oh. So they were the company together as they designed the book. So here's the cover. Here's what a, a chapter would look like. Mm -hmm. And so here's that work. There's a, the real picture of it. And then when we went in 2019, we took a photographer with us who took the pictures of the artist. So this is the beginning of the chapter, the artist. And then this is the one time when we're talking ourselves about the artist, what's on the blue pages. Most important, Louise, tell them about the index and our special glossary of relationships and our special glossary of terms and we, we the back of the book is really exciting yeah we were we were very lucky to get a publisher that had a very high standard of quality mm -hmm. and worked really hard to find a good design team and i was so impressed we had not just a copy editor but a real content editor that went through our text with us. I haven't had that experience. I think I wrote, not since Becky Davis edited Shigaraki Potter's Valley in the 1970s has somebody been so thorough. So we were simply lucky to find an excellent publisher that publishes books that it holds to its own high standards mm. in terms of quality of design and impact. The academic press situation would have been much more difficult. We wouldn't have had the same kind of book. But yeah. part of the reason I think we were able to appeal to a publisher like Monicelli, which doesn't specialize in Japanese books in any sense, was that the content of the book, as we were hoping it would, reached beyond the confines of subject matter that would be of interest only 
speaking to a specifically Japan focused audience. So it was just luck that it worked out that way. But I was going to just follow up one aspect of the book design that really pleased us was the photographs of the artists. And we were happy that the way that worked out was we got an introduction from one of the artists we were interviewing to a local Kyoto-based photographer. And we took a look at her work and saw that she was very good at very informal shots of people in action, which was exactly what we wanted. We didn't want staged portraits. We didn't want kitschy views of potters at their wheels, <laughs> etc. And so we traveled with that photographer and she was extremely discreet. She would kind of disappear into the background while we were talking. And all the time she'd be clicking her silent digital camera, taking the images of the artists talking to us. So I was really thrilled at the particular way the artists come across in those images is perfect for the fact that they're speaking in the book. And that was just a really wonderful introduction. Mm. Mark, if you want her name, she's in the book. <laughs> yes. Okay, and we're, we're coming up on, on timing. There's a number of, of other questions in the list, so maybe we'll keep speeding along. But we have a, a question from Patricia Massey. Right. Ah, I think it's written for everybody to see. The question was, you have an extensive collection, a really extensive collection that includes a lot of minge as well. And I was wondering why you focused on studio pottery rather than also including some of the so-called unknown craftsmen following the minge collect tradition. You've really introduced us to a lot of the folk craft pottery, but we didn't really know folk craft pottery in the way we got to know the studio potters. So we really didn't have an opportunity to get to know someone on that level of intimacy. It's interesting. I, I would not have thought about that until you asked the question. It's just, they weren't in our frame of reference after your trip. They no longer played a role in our collection. And, and Halsey, if I can say, when, in our fourth, Japan Society trip to Japan was led by Yagi Sakio, who was the daughter-in-law of Yagi Kazuo. Her whole trip was introducing us to the Sodesha artists mm -hmm. and to these sculptural artists that were brand new to us. And we were kind of amazed that we didn't know them and, they, and that the world didn't know them. And we were introduced by Koyanagi Yatsuko. We said, let's run with this ball. And we, di we didn't go back to Minge again. You're right, we have Minge, but what we collect is Sodesha and mm -hmm. sculptural. Mm -hmm. and, and, and let's be clear, the North Group collection, as people think about it. Ozzy, the North collection, not the North Group. Correct. Sorry, we used to run a company called the North Group. We made our living working in theater, not in ceramic. The collection does not exist anymore as one cohesive extant collection. It's been dispersed primarily to museums. So when you say, can we see the collection, even here in where we live now, we've moved to a retirement community in a very small apartment. And so there's not much room collection <laughs> but there's some pretty ones there's some pretty ones behind me yeah i, I noticed <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice ones behind alice we actually got rid of almost everything and i said i can't live without ceramics so last october we went back to mervis and came away with four new pots because i just couldn't live without the, this enrichment to see these works bring into our lives. They're like living with <clears throat> vases of flowers. And I get allergic to the flowers. 
but I can enjoy these pots enormously. But your your analogy is quite right. <laughs> I was just wondering if maybe the Minge potters would not have so much to talk about why they are doing what they are doing and so forth. Although it would be interesting to know why they chose to be unknown, Minge, rather than become artists, which they have so the choice, right? <laughs> so Patricia, that's a book you should write. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we can all look forward to that one. When I think of all the work you've done in years, I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll pass at this point. Oh, so most of the Minge come out of the Shokani tradition. And that yeah. You don't listen to the clay, you just make the form. And so that would be not listening to the clay. Well, uh, they are listening. They're listening, but in a different way. They're not trying to project their own personality on the clay as the artists would, right? I don't think our artists are true. I think they really are trying to listen to the kit, play many of them and not impose uh -huh. their personality. I think. But I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you. this one could go down a long hole. So <laughs> long, long, long. <laughs> we'll, we'll take off here. Thank you very much. We also have a, a question from John McCreary real quick. This has been a wonderful experience, this whole Zoom session. I am also an anthropologist and I come at it from a slightly different angle because for me, I'm sitting here thinking about the contrast between the conventional image of the ethnographer as the lone individual who goes off to a strange place they know nothing about and tries to figure out what is going on. And this very rich experience of you know, collectors and curators who have ongoing relationships with artists that go back and forth and well, there's just a lot to think about here. And I would like, and I may wind up trying to write something about it. And so one of the things I want to know is who I should contact when I want to check things like you, because I don't want to go putting words in your mouth. You can write to all three of us. That would right. be wonderful. Okay. And where do I find your contact information? Lynn or Zach? Yeah. Lynn or Zach. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks so much. I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much. We had uh, another question from Beatrix Yoshikawa. Yes, thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question is about logistics. I was wondering whether logistics and the transport of the ceramics from Japan to the US is organized by the artists themselves, or do you organize the transport? And is it by boat or by plane? and are using the post office. Could you give us some information? I'll start, what a wonderful question. We very quickly, and I think through Joan Mervis, became friends with Hakuichi, a, at that time, one of the best shippers. And what would happen is that we'd have the artist pack and get their works to the shipper and they'd all, be a mass and then they come in what are they called this big Tainters. cases containers they come in mm -hmm. containers and oh the day when they arrived at our apartment building in New York the lobby was filled with containers and pieces and we had to get a lot of people to help us get them up to the apartment and then open them one by one so Louise is that your experience too yes so by of course, that was a while ago. I don't know. COVID seems to have disrupted all sorts of shipping, mm -hmm. transporting mm -hmm. connections, but sending by ship through a reliable... Hakuichi is a, a Kyoto-based shipper. It has a lot of experience with fine arts shipping, uh, but working through someone like that was what I did for other personal shipping, what Alison Halsey did. Beatrice, you may be aware that one of the most important parts of collecting contemporary Japanese ceramics is you're collecting boxes. You know, beautiful boxes are made for the works and you have to put them somewhere. <laughs> and you have to have the pieces and the boxes in your mind and you have to keep very close track of them. Right, right. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay, thank you so much for being so generous with your time that, to tell us about this book and to answer our questions. All three of you, I've really enjoyed having this conversation.